since we're a little late. <coughs> All right. Did everyone get something to eat? Uh, again, should we do calisthenics? Do we need to do jumping jacks? Nothing like that. All right. A lap around the school. That might do it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It might be the... Uh, the last time you'd be able to do that with the storm coming or something like that. I don't know. Everyone's. Yeah, I know. Everyone's freaking out. Oh, no, man. We got lots to cover today. Particularly if you're not going to be here at school tomorrow, maybe. Right? Or Wednesday. Yeah. So I'll be here no matter what. That's how dedicated I am. The snow could be five feet high. I'll take Highway 6 right up and get here. That's right. Um, so, um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> so, all right. Um, so we'll see what happens tomorrow. So with, with not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, we are going to have our first tech club meeting, all right, which is at 4.30. So we'll see if this happens. If it doesn't, we'll wait till, we'll just postpone it till next week. Um, we're meeting in the port. It's on password hacking using a tool called John the Ripper. Okay, so um, it's really well known um, password cracking tool, and uh, I'll demonstrate how to use it both in a Linux machine and a Windows machine. Okay, to be able to get passwords. Is it free? It is definitely free. Yep, you can just do a search for it and find it, and you'll find all the information I found on it. So, yep. So lots of tools. We'll also, um, if we can get things set up, we'll also try and uh, record that session. So if you can't make it or something like that, um, or if I'm the only one here, you know, because of the snowstorm, I don't know. Um, no. That's right. So um, we'll see what happens. I don't know. With all the hype, I think it's going to be nothing. I don't know. You know, like end up being like a few snowflakes and that's it. I don't know. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, like I said, we'll, still, we'll have that meeting, um, weather permitting, right? All right. The other thing is, is uh, you have a homework assignment due for next class. So even if you are stuck inside through a snowstorm, you have a quiz for Chapter 17, I finally promised, is out there. It's the one on FTP. All right. I was more excited about FTP, I guess. So I can extend. I can. You can still do it. It's it's not that hard, guys. Um, and it's more recent stuff you did, right? Okay. Um, all right. So those are the two announcements. So that's your homework. The other thing I wanted to mention here was a few things. I know a few of you guys are looking at Linux Mint. Um, it is a really good Linux distribution. I don't. I'm not currently running it, but. Um, they, they do a lot of uh, cool, cool features and things that they're doing. One thing that the news article I saw about them was their donations. So this is a guy, he's a French guy who's living in Ireland and uh, who started this all by himself and he was doing this just part time and he's living strictly off donations. Donations that people send him. And he does track all that if you click on donations here from his website. You'll see everything. And in December, I guess, was one of his best months that he ever had. He's actually been able to hire two other full-time staff based upon just donations from people, <laughs> you know, not from corporations or anything like that. And um, so there's three people. If you look here, the blue line is actually 2015. And in December, he had $16,000, which is pretty good. Now, I don't think this all goes to their paycheck. Because he also has servers to maintain, he has to pay for that. He pays for a hosting company, he pays for the bandwidth that you use to download it, things like that, um, and can put more resources to that, you know. So, um, and then when you look at um, the green one here, that's 2014, and then this kind of more gray one is the 2013, and so it looks like. The 2015 was kind of a pretty good year overall for him, but you look at, look at like, I mean, December seems to be a pretty good month for him. 
and then it kind of drops down a bit here, you know. But then what he does, which I think is really cool, is he lists all the different countries and what they donated and how much. And then he actually lists the individuals that help pay. So number of donations. So that's out of 11 donations, $3,300. You know, so you, um, if you ever do donate, you get up on kind of his wall of fame here. Um, and then I thought he breaks it down. I thought you could... Click on... Oh, I can't find the page right now. <laughs> but he actually shows like every single donation. So even if you donated like $3, he lists it there. There's some place on the page here where he shows every single little donation that people have made, you know, because he's, he's, really, he's been able to quit his job, do what he loves, and be able to create a really good product, you know. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this is because um, just to show you the different models that are out there for open source, some um, applications that are open source or some Linux are owned by companies, some are owned by individuals, some, some are just done by part-time people, they have a full-time job during the day. Um, and uh, there's just different models. And this guy has been really successful in uh, what he's done. And um, open source is also about contributing back too, right? And you may not have money to be able to contribute back, but there's other ways in which you can help out and contribute back. And so he does have a link here, and most of the websites have these. It's something where you can participate. <laughs> Um, if you do like a particular product or an application or program, it doesn't have to be necessarily a Linux distribution. It could be Bind, which is the number one DNS server that's out there, you know, or it could be Apache, which is number one web server out there. It could be anything. And he, uh, he lists some links there. Obviously, donations he takes or sponsorships, which is kind of like a regular payment, you know, like so every month he'll, you'll pay five bucks or something like that. But then also um, joining the community. They have a really good forum out there that you can look at that offers help and guides and things like that um, that you can be a part of. Um, they have podcasts and um, being able to help others and connect to other people. You can also report bugs. That's really helpful for them. So if you find something that's wrong, it's not working exactly the way it is, you can report bugs. And then he even gives a, a spot here <coughs> to uh, register new ideas. Isn't that cool? That's something that you don't see with a lot of the pr other proprietary type of applications where they're like, give us your feedback. What do you like? Maybe we'll make the change. You know? And the more involved you actually are in the community, they probably have a mailing list too where you can interact with the guys who actually developed this. The more they kind of listen to your opinion and they may make changes that you like, you know, that you suggested and made, um, even though you're not maybe a programmer. right? So. Um, just really cool things. Translations, if you speak another language, you can always translate Linux Mint into another language. You know, all the help manuals and everything else, that's a great way to help out. Artwork, right? They, um, I know Fedora, they offer a contest for every new Fedora release for what's gonna be the official background wallpaper for that release. So if you're into photography or some type of graphic design or whatever, any type of art, you can be voted on, and they, they do this whole voting thing where you submit your, your picture, your image, and then they vote, and you have the official background for that release of Fedora. And I, I think they do a similar thing here for um, Linux Mint. Okay? And then obviously if you can code or program, they always, you can always contribute that way as well. Right? Um, so anyway, just, just to show you that there's uh, different ways in which you can contribute back to these products or companies that you like, and you actually get real world experience, right? Um, if you help, I mean, bug tracking and submitting bugs is a great way to kind of get your name out there, depending on what you want to do. If you want to do quality assurance for software and things like that, um, you can show that you have a really popular product where you have already have all this experience on being able to track down and triangulate bugs. And it's documented because it all goes on this web page. So at an interview, you can just go, hey, pull up this web page here. Here's my documentation of everything I've done. Right? 
That's also including writing document, um, doing chat, whatever you're doing, it's all tracked, which is really what one of the cool things about open source. All right. So anyway, that's my little soapbox on contributing back. You know, when you have time, and it doesn't have to be a lot of time or money or however you want to do it. Um, these are some options here for you. Now I put some help guides on yeah. Rock for you guys um, because the servers did go down this weekend. Um, I know everybody's all like, yep, screws everything up, right? Um, what you guys need to be aware of is that I know it's frustrating. However, um, you guys need to realize how lucky you are. No, really, because um, I have visited a lot of community colleges all over the country. I've, I've gone to and visited several universities for years where they do not have a setup like this at all. At all. Where users cannot just go in and mess with routers and switches and servers at all. And this is all kind of maintained by part-time staff. <laughs> right? And so, um, <coughs> You know, we don't have someone always here. If the power goes out, the, we'll, we can drive 40 miles in to flip on the switch and things like that. So just be aware of that, that um, you go to a lot of these other community colleges, they do not have this type of setup. It's one of the main reasons. I interviewed with over 12 different community colleges, and, and I got multiple offers. And the reason I came to Iowa Western was because of this setup, because I didn't see it anywhere else particularly where the students have access. And if you go to a four-year, sometimes they'll have you know, cool supercomputers and big things and things like that. You can't even touch it until you're a grad student. You know? So just understand, um, you know, even though it may be frustrating, I think most of your instructors are um, patient with you. you know, I mean, if something goes down and you're late and everything else, we make accommodations. Okay? So, um, and I know it's, fr it's frustrating for us, too. So just be aware of that too, you know. I don't mind um, the emails. I, I actually really appreciate it when you say, hey, I can't get in, you know, then that helps me know that it's down, particularly if there's more than one person telling me that, because then I go, okay, it's just not, you're just not typing in your password right, right? It's multiple people are having this issue. Um, so that, that is appreciated. Um, but, um, and I know it is frustrating. It's okay to be frustrated. But um, that's just kind of the reality of things and kind of understand, um, really how privileged you are to kind of have this set up, okay? Because every other college I've taught at, which I've taught at three other colleges, we didn't have vSphere or anything like that. You had to use VirtualBox on your own laptop and trying to run three Windows servers on your own laptop all at once is a lot worse than having to go through vSphere. You know, um, it's a lot more frustrating. So anyway, just be aware of that. Um, and the setup that we have here. Um, oh, so anyway, so that's what brings me back to that, is because um, I know when it restarts and things, some of you guys have had problems with the network connecting and everything else. So I put instruction guides here for Ubuntu and for CentOS on how to um, configure your network so it's a, with a static IP, so the, stat so the IP will stay the same, and also enables it when you reboot that it's st that the networking stays on. Okay. Now, what you need to be aware of these instructions, they're kind of generic instructions. You go in and you edit a file, you make some changes to them, but the IPs that are here aren't necessarily the IPs you put in. Okay. Like most of our IPs are not 192 class C IP addresses. We're using 10. Okay. And then the, the subnet mask, we're just using uh, 16, I believe. So it's 255.255.0.0, right? Which means the first two octets of the IP address is the network, and the other two are the host. Your gateway should always be the same, which should be your firewall IP address, right? Just the 10.10.1.200. And then your DNS servers, the same thing, should be the firewall IP address. Okay? And then if you want a secondary one, you can use Google's, which I use is just 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 .8, just because it's easy to remember. Okay? 
So um, hopefully this will help with some of the frustration when things do go down. Uh, we are working on uh, finding out issues as to why it keeps going down and uh, some solutions to do that. Okay. Um, same thing here with uh, CentOS. Not all of this, these IP addresses are exactly the same too, so just be aware of that. As well, if you need help, I can help you. I don't mind helping you out, okay? Um, and hopefully that'll uh, help you guys out a bit. All right, finally, I want to show you guys a little tip of the day, right? That's what I've been doing lately. So this is my last Vim tip. I know everyone's going to be sad, right? So this is uh, folding. So how to fold, it's, it's basically um, grouping up text and putting it all into one line. <laughs> right? Just so you can visually see things better, particularly with a file that has a lot of code and you kind of want to see the top, you want to see the bottom, you want to fold the middle, or you just want to fold sections because you go, ah, this part I know is right. So I'll fold that and then I'll just work on this other stuff. So let me show you. So this is just my VimRC file. And uh, what you do is you just kind of, you pick a section, and then you do shift V, which puts you in a visualize mode. And it highlights lines. And so now as I hit the down arrow, you see how it highlights a bunch of lines? Like that. So as it highlights a bunch of lines, then what you do is you, you press the keys Z and F. And see how it folds up? So at the top there it says 14 lines have been folded and then it gives you a little description of that first line so you kind of know. So particularly you fold at the comments, right? So you say this next part of the code does this, this, and this, right? And if you fold at that comment, like I do have here, it says it displays the status bar. So that's the part that I fo folded on of the code, okay? Now to unfold it, you do Z and the O key. And that unfolds it for you. Now you can fold multiple um, portions of text. You can also do folds within folds if you want. Um, you know, let me fold a few things here just so you guys can see. I'll go down to that end function, do ZF. Then maybe I'll go down here. I'll fold that little section, ZF, things like that. Okay, and that's that's how it looks. Let me see if I can move it down. See if it looks. So it kind of looks like that. Okay. Um, if you now, what will happen is is if you save this file and then just exit out, it removes all these folds that you've done. Okay, it's it doesn't permanently stay. So if you want to keep the folds that are there in uh, edit, uh, edit mode, right, not insert mode, you can do colon at the bottom and you type make view, MK view <coughs> at the bottom. You hit enter and then that will keep the folds that you have or at least it marks where they were at. Then if you escape out of that, I'm just going to hit colon Q. And then if you open it up again, you notice it's not folded, right? So to load the folds that you previously had, you do load view, and that brings your folds back that you want it to. So anyway, just a little um, Vim tip. Yeah? So you can only have one view saved at a time? Uh, no. This is just one method of folding. <laughs> no, I meant saving your view. No, you can save multiple views. <laughs> no, where you'd name the fold views if you want. Yeah, but that gets a little bit more complex. So I'm just showing you basically. Like folding can get, you can set um, conditions on your folding in your RC file to where like fold at this curly bracket to this all curly bracket. So then you can instantly do all folds and then everything between curly brackets will fold or you can do odd configurations. that, Or you can do set it up for like three asterisks in a row and then when you're doing your stuff, you can just put three asterisks and then it'll fold between the three asterisks. Whatever <coughs> pattern you want it to set up as, and then you can save multiple views and other things like that. There's, there's tons of 
different ways to do it. Um, this is actually just a really basic way. Yeah. But yeah, and I, um, if you Google it, you can find it really easy. Yeah. So anyway, um, that's folding for Vim. And um, so with kind of using tabs and folding and all that, hopefully this has helped uh, improve some of your uh, Vim skills. I know it has with me. And um, I've enjoyed it. So, all right, guys, we're going to go a little light this week, okay? Because we've had it intense the last few weeks, right? Setting up the labs and all the problems with that and um, FTP and all that kind of stuff, right? So we'll be a little light. So <coughs> I'm going to lecture a little bit, and then we'll have a short lab using a tool called F um, TCP Dump, okay? It's basically, if you've ever heard of Wireshark, it's the command line, similar equivalent of Wireshark. And you can actually create Wireshark files and load them into Wireshark and other things like that. Um, and that's basically what Chapter 11 is all about, is about how to use TCP dump. Um, in its different formats, how to read what it's outputting, um, different usage, for it um, and everything else. But before we get into that, before we get into lab, you need to have some basic um, networking knowledge. Okay? So we'll see kind of where you at, are at with uh, McGill. Okay? And I asked him today, I go, we're going to cover this and this and this. He goes, oh yeah, we covered it. And so I'm going to go, all right, so they should all know. When I say encapsulation, everyone knows what encapsulation is, right? Sounds fair, okay. All right, so we'll cover briefly what it is. Chapter 7 only covers a few pages of TCP IP, what it is. So hopefully this is a review. If you remember anything, I might throw some questions out that raise your hand. Let me know what you know. Um, or maybe it'll just be a good refresher for you. Okay? Um, all right. So the first thing is, is uh, what is IP? Because TCP IP is really two things, right? You have TCP and then you have IP. So what does IP do? First off, let's talk about, all right, let's go simpler. What is a protocol? Does anyone know what a protocol is? A set of rules. Yeah, it's in the military. You know, I think of it in military, these spy movies, you know, you got to <laughs> follow protocol, right? That's all it is. You notice that a lot of these protocols that we use, they all end in P, right? IP, TCP, HTTP, right? That's all because the P actually means protocol and all these things. So um, did you guys talk specifically about IP at all in McGill's class or just did or it was quick or? It is layer three in the OSI model. Yes. And what what's, does it generally do? Do. Yeah. Identifies devices. It what? Identifies devices. It, it needs to know, yeah, I, identify devices. What do, you, what do you mean by that? I'm, I'm, I'm That's it? You're back in the way? Okay. I'm not to. No, you're fine. Um, it's, it's, it helps with routing and addressing. addressing. So it keeps track of addresses like where the sender address is and where the destination address is. And it's really good at being able to find that. Okay? But what normally happens is, is IP is encapsulated usually inside a TCP packet. Okay? So what does TCP do? Does anyone know? Usually TCP is compared to UDP. <coughs> So TCP guarantees delivery, right? So are you, are you guys familiar with what a packet is? Okay, everyone knows a packet, good. So a packet's kind of that smallest little chunk of data, right? And uh, let me show you encapsulation here. So maybe this will help. So this is my little demonstration. So usually these are like nesting dolls, is basically what encapsulation is, or, if, or uh, you guys know those Russian nesting dolls, right? You take off the top, there's a smaller doll inside. You take off the top, and there's a smaller one, right? 
It's kind of, that's encapsulation. It's things wrapped up inside each other or envelopes, right? So this is the way it normally works. And this is kind of working from the bottom, meaning the data, the physical layer, going up the OSI model, where you have a piece of data. Yeah, so you have the number nine blue or something. That's your data, right? Which then you put into an Ethernet protocol, OK? But Ethernet can only read MAC addresses, right? Do you guys know what MAC addresses are, right? It's the physical number on your network card. Yeah, burned in. It's the burned in address it's called sometimes, right? All right. So Ethernet only works at that level, right? So that doesn't get us very far, right? So usually then they enwrap it into an IP address, OK? Because that knows addresses, IP addresses, and it works at that level, right? So when we're talking about 192.168 or 10.10.1.2, that's what IP knows. It knows that language. But the Ethernet is wrapped up inside that IP address. It's encapsulated inside that. Now, the problem is, is IP, it just sends something once. And if it gets there or not, nobody knows. It could get there. It could die on its way there. Um, it may, um, whatever, get there and get rejected. And then it just dies. So what normally happens is, is you take an IP address and you encapsulate it into and wrap it around TCP, OK? TCP guarantees delivery. And there's a whole protocol on that, right? It keeps checking. It's like this, uh, I don't want to put something to it. A person who's always nagging and checking if you're there, OK? I won't put a title to that. Um, sure, your mother. Um, where, where it sends out a packet and it goes like, did you get there? Did you get there? Send me back an acknowledgment that you got there. Call me when you get there, right? And it sends back, so I got there, OK. Are you sure you're OK? Yes, I'm OK. OK, good. All right? And that's the way TCP works, OK? And then that way, you guarantee that your IP and your Ethernet packets all get there fine, which actually then contains your data, right? That's what encapsulation is, things wrapped up in each other. OK? Um, now, sometimes IP addresses are not always wrapped up, or IP protocol packets are not always wrapped up in TCP. Sometimes they're wrapped up in something called UDP. So is anyone familiar with UDP? OK? UDP is similar to TCP, except it's not as nagging. Right? It doesn't care about you as much as your mother. OK? If you go there and you die, it doesn't care. Yes. It's specifically used for streaming. Like when you're streaming your Netflix, that uses UDP, right? Because if you're missing just one fraction or piece of that one frame that pops up on the screen for a hundredth of a second, are you going to notice any difference? No. Who cares if that one packet gets lost? Right? However, if you're missing a chunk of a web page, will you notice that? Yeah. So HTTP is sent to TCP. OK? For things that need everything there. OK? Email, you know, stuff like that. OK? So that's the difference between TCP, UDP, and encapsulation. Now, each of these protocols have headers to them. Have you guys talked about headers? OK. So let's look at a header, because that's what we're going to look at with TCP dump. We're actually going to look at these headers. We're going to actually look at these packets. And we're going to actually look at all the different pieces of that. All this theory that you guys have been learning uh, in McGill's class and everything else, this is what we're going to look at. Maybe you guys have already done Have you done something, something similar to that yet? OK. Well, then we'll start it out here. So here, this is, the, this is drawn out usually in, in several different ways. So usually these packets, this data, at the most basic layer, what's the bottom layer of the OSI model? The physical layer, right? That's electrons. That's basically where you get an on or off electrical pulse, right? 
which basically converts down to ones and zeros, right? Where you get a byte for every one or zero that's there. So each of those ones and zeros, each of those bytes represents something in this packet. If you take several of those ones and zeros, that's your packet, okay? And within that packet, there's bits of information in there. And you guys are going to get way into depth in this lab for this, right? You're going to actually pull one down, you're going to break apart each ping and tell me what each part is. All right, your chapter breaks it all down for you, okay? So the first one here tells you the version. This tells you the length of the header. So how long of this whole mess of ones and zeros do I get is actually the header and the information part, and which part's actually the data part, right? Um, different types of services. What's the total length of the whole part? Time to live, which is how long should I hang around before I give up and just die because you won't accept me? Things like that. What type of protocol is it? So is it IP? Is it TCP? What? Um, you have different flags that are on there, kind of like TCP has all those annoying, nagging type flags like acknowledgments. They, like, are you there? Did you get there on time? You did? Okay, make sure you call me back. That's TCP, right? Um, and the, it has all these different flags of those acknowledgments, okay? Um, fragment, you also have a source IP address. So where did this thing come from? And where do you want me to send it to, right? And so forth. And then you have port numbers, depending on what you're sending. So if you're sending like doing the SSH connection, right? That uses a different port than FTP does, right? which is different than Telnet, or which is different than HTTP, right? And then you have a checksum to validate, and this is specific to uh, TCP, well, some other protocols too, where that's the checksum to validate that everything that was received is right, right? Okay, so all these parts, you guys are gonna tell me about all these parts, and you're actually gonna look at them and break them out, okay? So that's the headers to each file, yes? What didn't really say, or at least I forget, what unit of time does it use for the time to live? Yes. It, it, yes, it's, it's for hops. So it's how many times, how many times is it going to bounce around? There's no um, time like we keep time. It's number of touches. It's based off the number of routers. That are yes. Right number of routers that it bounces to. So if it ends up bouncing around too much, it dies. That way, that way we don't have all these lost packets just bouncing around, congesting up our network. That's the reason for the time to live. That eventually you want them to die, right? If they never find a home, just die already, okay? So that's, that's your headers. And I also want to explain a little bit about how all these protocols flow up through the operating system, okay? And uh, there should be some nice diagram, but I didn't have time to find one. I didn't like the ones I saw online, so you kind of just get a, a list, okay? So the first thing that happens is the network card receives a packet, okay? Then it checks to see if it will accept it. Go, am I going to allow this? And this is all happening at the physical layer. Okay, if it accepts it because it goes, oh, okay, this is the right IP address, the right MAC address, or whatever else, all right, I'll let you in. Yeah. So it looks at the address header, and it decides if it accepts it. If it accepts it, it actually makes a copy of that into the memory inside your network card. Okay, there's a bit of cache or memory that's in your network card that it holds on to. Okay, then what it does is it sends an interrupt to your operating system. Okay. An interrupt um, back in the olden days was basically it was literally a wire that went to your CPU to say, "Hey, stop! I have something else coming," you know, and then your CPU and, and uh, prioritizes how important that is, right? But it says, "Hey, it gets in line, but take a ticket number for the CPU, right?" So that's what it hap happens here. That's what the interrupt is, and then the OS once it takes it and is processing it. It calls for the driver for the network card. So now you're working your way up, right? Now you're getting into this kind of these software layers, right? Up the network card. And um, gets your OS 
um, to get the driver of the network card to process the packet. Then the driver copies that packet from the, mem from the network card memory over to the system's memory. And what's the system memory? RAM, yeah, your RAM is your system's memory, okay? So to copy it over there to your system memory. Then the driver determines the protocol. So your network driver will say, oh, that's an IP address. Oh, that's a TCP ad packet, you know, or whatever, um, whatever protocol it is. Then the driver takes it to what's called a handler, which is usually built into your operating system to be able to go then, oh, I can decipher a TCP header. And it will unwrap it, and it will do it backwards, right? So it will take that TCP one and has to take off that layer with, through that handler. And then it goes, oh, there's an IP packet in, you know, header inside that. I need to pass that over to the IP handler, who then can interpret this and tell me what to do with it, who then passes it in. And then the layers are stripped off, and then finally you get... Oh, it's just a lame nine blue Uno card. Thanks. Um, okay, so that's what happens here, and this happens a few times. Then the packets continue to come and begin to line up because this stuff is coming quick, and they go into a queue, right? That's when you. It's, well, it's separate to the buffer, but you can kind of think of it that way, where things are just getting backed up, right? And basically, the queue gives numbers to all these things coming in, waiting to be evaluated. Okay, and then again, the various layers are removed up through the OSI model um, until you get your data and your information up at the application layer, usually, right? Through your web page, through your browser, or something like that. Okay, um, so that's the basics of what we're going to be looking at. All right, through a TCP dump. Okay, uh, do I have the lab visible there for you guys? Uh, why do I do that? All right. All right, guys should see it now. I'll pull it up here. I don't think Word's installed on here. <clears throat> All right, let me shut this off.